via Zoom during the corona crisis of 2020. Hi, and welcome to The Doctor Is In. I'm Frank Spidell, retired emergency physician and recovering hospital administrator. For what I will discuss today, I invite your robust doubt and skepticism. For as the great physicist and humanist, Richard Feynman reminded us, science is the organized skepticism in the on the reliability of expert opinion. Professor Feynman also observed, I would rather have questions that can't be answered than answers which can't be questioned. Now, I am neither an epidemiologist, public health official, nor infectious, nor infectious disease specialist. Always defer for your healthcare guidance to your primary physician, your local and state health departments, and the CDC. Again, I emphasize for your health guidance, rely on your primary physician, local and state health departments, and the CDC. As I wrote the introduction to today's show, we have lost more than 235,000 Americans to COVID. You'll see a slide of the New York State, Pennsylvania, U.S., and Sweden mortality rates. Again, I note New York State has a COVID mortality rate that is two and a half times greater than the U.S. as a whole. And, there are th and it is three times that of the no lockdown, protect the vulnerable Sweden uh, approach. You'll see a slide that shows the daily deaths of Sweden, Sweden has tapered down. Uh, probably will come up again. It's a, it's a disease that uh, increases with indoor presence like seasonal influenza. But enough of where we are in 2020. Where have we been? Sadly, some things seem to hideously endure. In the fifth century BC, the Greek philosopher Socrates was executed by the good citizens of Athens. His crime, corrupting the youth. He questioned the status quo. We have progressed. The glory of the late Renaissance coincided with the hideous darkness of the Inquisition, where the enlightened used violence to eliminate dissent, to control those who saw and thought differently. In 1615, those anointed keepers of the truth, the fact checkers of the 17th century, focused on a very, very dangerous man. Galileo Galilei. He was dangerous. He looked around. He observed. He measured. He quantified. He recorded. He analyzed with the wits his creator gifted him. And worse, he published. He published the idea that the earth revolved around the sun. In so doing, he crossed the fact checkers of his day, the Jesuits. He ended up in the crosshairs of the Roman Inquisition. He was convicted of heresy in 1632 and sentenced to imprisonment for the rest of his life. Upon his sentencing, Galileo reportedly said as he left the court and stamped on the earth, E por si muave, yet it still moves. The COVID-19 pandemic seems to be bringing a new dark age, a reborn inquisition where enlightened fact checkers determine what is true and what can be published lest the unwashed proles, the masses, consider and embrace heresy. For those who speak out and publish against accepted wisdom, there are consequences. One of my prior guests, Dr. Paul Offit, has received death threats from anti-vaxxers for his reasoned, eloquent views of the benefits and efficacies of vaccines. And even in the universities, long the fortresses for free and vigorous exchange of ideas there will be sanctions and persecutions for those who stray from accepted and correct thoughts. Rarely, a group of scientists, recently, a group of scientists eminent in their disciplines, teaching at the world's most acclaimed institutions, published a document, the Great Barrington Declaration, challenging the accepted nostrums of, pub, of the public health establishment. You may not have heard of this declaration, for censorship like foolery abounds everywhere. Allow me to present a brief summary of the Great Barrington Declaration. The authors declare, current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term health, leading to greater excess mortality in the years to come. The signers further note, keeping these measures in place until a vaccine is available 
will cause irreparable harm with the underprivileged disproportionately harmed. And they also write, we know that all populations will eventually reach herd immunity and observing adopting measures to protect the vulnerable should be the central aim of public health responses to COVID-19. The authors close the declaration with a recommendation. Those who are not vulnerable should immediately, immediately be allowed to resume as no, a normal life. The signers are an interesting group. The three principal signers are Dr. Sumetra Gupta, an Oxford professor of epidemiology, Dr. J. Bhattacharya, a Stanford Medical School professor of epidemiologist, and our guest today, Dr. Martin Koldorf, a biostatistician epidemiologist and professor of medicine at Harvard University. The other co-signers aren't too shabby either. <laughs> they include a Nobel Prize winner from Stanford, ethicist, and a catalog of professorial level medical specialists from significant institution. They are a multinational assembly, but all share careers of prominence, title, and recognition. They and their declaration have also received condemnation. No surprises here. Dr. Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, has been quoted by Yahoo News as saying, if you let infections rip, as it were, and say, let everybody get infected that's going to be able to get infected, and then we'll have herd immunity. Quite frankly, that is nonsense, he declared. Anybody who knows anything about epidemiology will tell you that it is nonsense and very dangerous. Because what will happen is that if you do that, by the time you get herd immunity, you have killed a lot of people that would have been avoidable. Further response came from a group publishing the John Snow Memorandum in the October 31st, 2020 Lancet. Among the flurries this group produced are some reasonably certain. Aerosol transmission occurs, especially in poorly ventilated areas. Yeah, I agree with that. Some are, in my view, deserving of clarification and inspection. Rapid testing, contact tracing, and isolation are also critical in controlling transmission like we did that with the HIV pandemic? And whom do we test? Everyone, instantaneously? And there are a few assertions that are nebulous and undefined, having all the sense of medieval cant, such as endorsing effective pandemic controls while never explicitly specifying what they are. To this, the Snow authors add a blizzard of assertions, such as, this is dangerous fallacy, unsupported by scientific evidence, one must note the authors of the aptly named Snow Memorandum identify Japan, Vietnam, and New Zealand as getting it right in controlling transmission. Oddly, they never mention Sweden. They must not get the New York Times. Our guest today to bring light in this winner of our discontent is one of the principal authors of the Great Barrington Declaration, Professor Dr. Martin Koldorf, professor, biostatistician, and epidemiologist at the Harvard Medical School. Professor, I am honored to welcome, welcome you to The Doctor Is In. It is no easy path to take, the, take on the enshrined totems and shibboleths of conventional wisdom. So I massively respect your willingness to bring a differing voice. Were it not for people such as yourself, Professor, raising recent dissent, we would still be measuring our GDP in pyramids built annually. Professor, welcome to The Doctor's Inn, and what did I get wrong? Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure, and I didn't get anything that you get wrong, so. Okay. Uh, do lockdowns work? Have they been tried before? Uh, no. It's a big experiment uh, for this year. And uh, if we go back uh, to uh, the pandemic preparedness plan that most countries prepared uh, before the start of this year, in years past, they don't talk about lockdowns. They talk about protecting those at highest risk. So the Great Parenting Declaration is very much in line with the various pandemic preparedness plans that different countries had prepared uh, previously, but that were thrown out the window at the beginning of this year. Uh, by pretty much every country except Sweden. 
Uh, England, tried, the UK thought about doing it, and they quickly changed their mind. Um, as we talked earlier, I was somewhat curious, why, what do you think happened that we all of a sudden lost everything that we thought about before in approaching a pandemic? I don't know, maybe a psychologist or sociologist or journalist can answer that better, but uh, there was a study from uh, Imperial College that uh, claimed that uh, there would be uh, more than a million deaths in the United States and uh, such, uh, many half a million or so in, in the UK. And uh, uh, that, uh, that study was based on uh, flawed input parameters. So maybe that uh, contributed to a lot of fear. I've, one of my prior guests made the observation that this was going to be very unique because in the United States, it was a confluence of a novel virus causing a pandemic and an election season. Uh, there is a tendency for action bias where you want to do something when things are happening, especially when you're running for office, you want to be seen to be forceful and to be out there protecting people. I wonder if that may not have caused some of the problems. Maybe that could play in, play, have played a role. The American Academy of Pediatrics has offered comments about virtual schooling. Did they get it wrong? Uh, are children at great risk from dying from COVID-19 and transmitting it? No. So uh, as a scientist, if you want to ask that question, we should look at the country that didn't close the schools, which is Sweden. And uh, uh, all schools, uh, daycare and schools were open throughout the whole height of the pandemic from ages one to 15. And there are 1.8 million children in Sweden in this age group. And during this time, exactly zero of them died from COVID-19. And there were a handful only, only a handful of uh, hospitalizations. We also know from studies that children tend to transmit much less than adults. There was a study, a genetic study from uh, Iceland, where they could they look at the genetics of the virus and see who transmits to whom, and they could see that it's typically adults uh, infecting children rather than children infecting adults. Uh, we also could see from the Swedish study that the, the school teachers, if, if children were spreading it a lot, you would expect school teachers to have high risk. But they had uh, the same risk as uh, the average of other professions. So uh, they are at more risk from getting it from a fellow teacher than they are from, from the kids in school. I, I'm, what you're telling me is, is not surprising, but I, I, am, I am surprised that I, I read this and see this Yet I just hear lectures about we can't take a chance on opening up the schools. It's, yeah, it's very strange. I mean, there's no public health reasons to keep the schools closed. And of course, schools are critically important uh, for children, not only for their education, but also for their physical health and me mental health and also for uh, the social development. So we're really putting an enormous burden here on children and the children who are suffering the most are working class children because the children of the wealthy, they could put them in a private school or hire a tutor or pod schooling. But that, those, that's not options for, uh, for middle class and, and uh, uh, working class uh, families. It sounds like you're saying that there are unintended consequences, medical and social and long standing to these lockdowns? Yes, uh, there's a lot of collateral damage. Uh, and this is just one example for the children. But we know that children who have less, less both short term, but also long term, because we know that children with less education do less well in terms of health uh, later on in life. And it's very surprising because uh, this summer, I think it was maybe in July, the New England Journal of Medicine had a, a commentary on where the school should open. And there was a lot of... Uh, interesting things in it, but they completely ignored Sweden, which is the one example with the huge sample size of what happens if you keep schools open during a pandemic. And it was not even mentioned uh, in New England Journal of Medicine article, even though the report from Sweden had came out about a month earlier. There's something else about Sweden. I have, it seems to me, obviously I don't speak or read Swedish, 
But it seems to me that there is a much more forthright discussion about public health policies in Sweden than what I see around here. It is almost as if if you question. That's why I started this out talking about the challenges when we are reluctant to question established statements, conventional wisdom of the problems we get ourselves into. I didn't sense that in what I've seen reported in Sweden. It looks like there was a lot of discussion. Yes, and there were a group of academics, the 20, 22 of them, but then the numbers varied from op-ed to op-ed, uh, who were very critical of the Swedish approach. And they published many op-eds and articles and commentaries in the major daily newspapers. And I don't agree with what they said, but I'm very glad that they did voice it because you have to have that discussion. And for a thing like a pandemic, it has to be public for uh, all citizens to be able to follow that. And uh, the, the infectious disease technologists in Sweden, they were mostly in favor of the Swedish approach with one uh, major exceptions. So the critique came from other areas of academia, oncologists, uh, et cetera not the infectious disease technologists. But it's still important to have that discussion. Uh, and uh, I, I'm glad that they did voice their concerns. And that's besides their, besides their adoption of the, uh, of the concept of protecting those at risk and uh, the rest of us live our lives. Uh, besides that, it's also an education for us to a healthy open public discussion where everybody gets to listen to people that are experts in the field as they disagree. That does not hurt us as a society, I don't think. On the contrary, I think it benefits us a lot. And one concern I have is uh, the trust in science after this pandemic is over. Um, and I think to have trust in science, you have uh, people have to feel that everybody who has a view can actually are allowed to express it, that there's nothing that's censored. Or, uh, uh, or sweep under the rug. People have to have the trust that anybody in the science community uh, can actually voice their views in an open manner. Uh, that is how we make progress last time I looked. I'm concerned about what's happening around me, what's happening in the world I experience, uh, Professor. But isn't this affecting the world? Isn't this economic contraction hurting not just Americans and Swedes, but is, is this a problem for the globe? Yes, and the Great Parental Declaration is international with the whole world in mind. And if we look at Africa and Asia, like say India, for example, or South Africa, uh, and many other countries there, there has been a huge problem among the poorest of society who lives from day to day. They get the income to buy the food they get that day. They work in the markets on the streets of Delhi or in Johannesburg and so on. And they have their estimates that there might be about 10,000 children who die each month now from because of the lockdowns, because of hunger. And of course, there are many more who go hungry, which will have very negative effects, of course, short term, but also long term on these children as they grow up. So it's an enormous tragedy in the world uh, with these lockdowns. So one of our uh, goals with the Great Barrington Declaration was to reach the whole world and to show the rest of the world that there are there is not scientific consensus uh, that lockdowns is a good thing. On the contrary, there are many scientists who think it's not a good idea. Uh, and I think it has had a beneficial effect uh, in many countries. Uh, I am very grateful you put your names to it and that you got the word out. Uh, I, I think you're going to get pushback. Let me, you sort of, you, you're bringing up another topic that I think is, uh, needs to get discussed more, at least among my group that I, I talk with on a routine basis. It's gratuitous. Every death is a tragedy. We are all diminished when somebody dies, and we are certainly diminished if the death is avoidable. Uh, it's, it's, it's a healthy part of being human. Needless deaths, we have to fight against all the time. So one of the things I hear thrown back at me all the time is, uh, well, if we can just save one life by doing this, by keeping the kids out of school, 
we've done something. Uh, we really don't believe that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Professor. Every year in the United States, 32,000 Americans die in motor vehicle accidents. If there were no cars, if we all rode horses to and from wherever we have to go, if transportation was done purely on horseback or by foot, we would save 32,000 Americans. We may lose a few people that are thrown from the horse and break their neck. There are things that we could do that would save lives every day. But haven't we sort of as a society embraced a risk reward trade-off? That there are some things that we have chosen, even in public health. Uh, I remember that during the HIV pandemic, and I was right in the front lines of that, uh, we did not trace contacts of people that were HIV positive that we diagnosed. Uh, we could not tell the partner of somebody that the person that they spent, that they had their, uh, their time with, we could not tell them that their partner was HIV positive. There were decisions made that affected outcomes for people that may have taken lives. So are there any cardinal principles in public health that are, or is there a concept of risk reward we should be looking at? I think there are three very basic principles of public health that was thrown out the windows in the beginning of this year. One is that in public health, you can't look short term, you have to look long term. Uh, the second one is you can't look only on one disease like COVID-19. You have to look at health uh, overall. So uh, if you save one life by uh, from COVID-19, you can't do that at the expense of uh, losing uh, hundreds of lives due to cardiovascular disease or cancer. So the lockdown has had enormous uh, tragic collateral damage uh, on health, public health in general. And uh, I, I saw a graph last week with the number of doctor's visits, which plummeted in the spring and it went up a little bit in the summer, but not back to normal. So the number of medical visits that people do are way down. And the last I heard, people do not go to the doctors just for the fun of it. They <laughs> to get uh, treated for some disease they have or to get preventive care that will uh, help them with their diabetes or their cardiovascular disease or their cancer, et cetera. So when the medical visits go down, we know that that has negative effects on long-term health. Maybe not this year, but uh, long-term. And childhood immunizations plummeted uh, this year. Uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes are much worse. Uh, there are many fewer cancer diagnoses made. And that might seem great, but it's not because people still have cancer. It's just we're not detecting them. And if we detect them later, it means that somebody who might have lived 15, 20 years more is maybe now will die three or four years from now. So these are things that uh, collateral damage from the lockdowns that we might, some of it we see in, in the statistics for this year, but not all of it, but it's something we're gonna have to live with and die with for several years to come. The other big thing is the mental health that has deteriorated uh, uh, during these lockdowns, both for people who have mental health problems as well as for other people who are experiencing new mental health issues because of the lockdown. So these are very tragic and uh, ignoring these in our, in our strategy on how to deal with the pandemic is, uh, is very tragic and it goes against the uh, uh, principles of how we deal with public health. Uh, the other thing, uh, the third principle is uh, public health is about protecting everybody in society, including the poor and the working class and the vulnerable, both the young and the old. And what we've, do, we've been doing is we are protecting lower risk college students by not letting them go to university and we are protecting lower risk professionals like uh, journalists and uh, scientists and lawyers, et cetera, who can work from home. While older working class people, uh, they have to work uh, as a janitor, as a bus driver or cab driver, as working in the supermarket, et cetera. 
And they are high risk. So they are the ones, even though they're high risk, they are the ones who are building the immunity uh, that eventually will protect everybody. Uh, am I one of those science des deniers that my parents used to warn me about? Uh, what is herd immunity that you've, we've talked about? Is it a good thing? Uh, how can we achieve it if it's a good thing? So first of all, it is uh, a well-established scientific uh, phenomena that we know exist, just like gravity in physics. <laughs> so uh, uh, that should be first clear. Secondly, with a disease like uh, COVID-19, we will get there sooner or later, just like we have for the other coronaviruses. Uh, COVID-19 will never go away, it will always be endemic. But, and there will be a few deaths every year, but the pandemic will end through herd immunity, either through a vaccine or through national infection or a combination of the two. So we will eventually reach there. So the key thing is how do we get there with, the, with as low mortality as possible? And, and what is the herd immunity? Well, the herd immunity says that the pandemic will end before everybody gets sick, before everybody's infected, because as soon as a certain proportion they are immune, that means that the disease can no longer spread widely in the community. And then those who haven't been infected yet will not be infected. They will be protected through the from the herd. Uh, so herd is herd immunity is how the herd uh, is protecting those who are not, who didn't get uh, infected in the beginning. So the question is then, what strategy do we use? Well, one thing is do nothing. That's a terrible idea. We have to rip through society. Well, if we do that, some old people are getting infected and some young people. And since the old are at high risk, there will be death there, mortality. If we do protect everybody equally through an age-wide lockdown, we can push things into the future. Uh, but uh, we will still have some old people and some young people getting infected because they're equally protected. So then we will also have a high mortality because a fair amount of old people are getting infected. On the other hand, if we do focus protection, we protect those old people and other high-risk groups, where we let younger adults uh, live lives normally, uh, still washing hands and being careful and uh, being home with sick and those things. So they sh nobody should deliberately get infected, but they can live their life normally. Then what happens is we have fewer of the old people getting infected. And that means that the mortality will be less. So the focus protection will reduce the uh, overall mortality. And if we had used it from the beginning, we would not have had over 200,000 deaths in the US by now. We would have had much less, less if we had properly protected the elderly. Professor, I'm sorry we're at the end of our time, but I value so much you being a guest on the show. Greatly appreciate that. I also value you and your colleagues embracing science and being willing to take, you're probably getting abuse for everything you said and everything you've published. I'm glad you're doing it. And for the folks Thank out there have taken the time to tune in to watch The Doctor Is In, be safe, take care and uh, follow us again. Thanks, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much.